Welcome back to this week's episode. Last week, I mentioned we were going to be talking a little bit more about the latest Girardi updates. I attended via Zoom the court hearing uh, last week when you're listening to this on November 16th. It was very interesting. So we're going to be talking about what's going on with regard to Erica Girardi in the realm of the Girardi lawsuits, some stuff that popped off on Twitter that is related to what's going on with Erica Girardi. And then there is another lawsuit in the Rust Set tragedy that includes a pretty powerful statement from the script supervisor. And we will be going through that statement at the end of the show. It does contain a lot of details. It is, it is a lot of information. So we're going to go through that at the end, because if you want to opt out of knowing all the things, it's sad. Uh, it's okay to opt out. We're going to get into the Girardi stuff first. Just we're like, we're in lawsuit season. I feel like everybody's getting their billables in before the end of the year. And we are going to be jogging on the treadmill of lawsuits between now and Christmas. It's just busy. So, you know, as we're getting into the beginning of the Thanksgiving season this week and into the beginning of the early this year Hanukkah season, happy holidays to you that celebrate in the U.S. I know Thanksgiving is celebrated in Canada on a different day. I don't know when that is, but I know it's coming. <laughs> happy Thanksgiving to you as well. And we are just going to roll into today's show and just start talking about Erica Girardi and this lawsuit and Twitter, because that's what's happening right now. Hey there, welcome to The Emily Show. I'm your host, Emily D. Baker, badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator, breaking down the legal shit in the news and pop culture stories you want to talk about. I've been a licensed attorney for over 15 years, I'm a former prosecutor, and I'm a big fan of the cursey words. So let's break it down. Before we get too deep into it, I'm going to do just a quick recap of procedurally where we're at. Tom Girardi, former golden boy of the plaintiff's bar in the mass tort arena, had a massive fall from grace around this time last year when Edelson PC in December filed a lawsuit against him in Illinois in relation to the Lion Air plane crash disaster and their mutual clients. Lion Air sued Tom Girardi, Erica Girardi, other members of the law firm, the law firm itself, for legal fees and for funds that did not go to the clients and has been seeking relief in that court. Their lawsuit prompted and their notice to the court prompted the judge in the Lion Air case to be like, hold up, wait a minute. What is happening? Where did the $2 million that's left to go to these clients go. And with these clients, there are many law firms representing the surviving families with the remaining families of those lost in the Lion Air disaster. This is not 2 million for all of the families. I Saying surviving sounds as if someone survived the crash and we know that that is not true. So I'm trying to... It, it, what is the right word to use? I just don't know. But the surviving families, the clients, the widows and orphans of those lost in that air disaster. So there are many different plaintiff's firms involved in this, but Girardi Keese, an LA law firm, was working with Edelson PC, who has a base in Illinois, here an Illinois-based firm. Words are going to be hard this whole show, we can already tell. They're an Illinois-based firm, so they are local counsel to Girardi Keese, who was directly in communication with the clients. And when that all started to going south and it became obvious, according to Edelson PC's lawsuit, it became obvious to them that their clients hadn't been paid. They brought it to the attention of the court. They filed suit. The court then did a bunch of order to show cause hearings with Tom Girardi's lawyers. Tom Girardi didn't speak in court other than to say he was present. And that's when his lawyers brought to the court the concern that the money might be gone. That's when the assets were frozen. We saw all of that go down on Real Housewives at Beverly Hills when they were all in Palm Springs reading articles that were coming out from the LA Times and trying to figure out what the assets being frozen meant before the bankruptcy started, before the conservatorship of Tom Girardi started, before all of this really came out. And that gets us to 
where we are today, which is Edelson BC still wanting to pursue their lawsuit against Erica Girardi. But before we get all the way into that, we need to thank today's sponsor. A big thank you to today's sponsor, Cerebral. Cerebral is an online mental health service that offers prescription medication, counseling, and therapy for anxiety, depression, insomnia, and more. I've shared with you guys that I have ADHD. I have in the past struggled with depression. And the thing I really like about Cerebral is not only do they offer counseling and therapy, but they also offer medications. I don't know if it's just me, but going to pick up my medications when I needed them always was uncomfortable. Maybe it was just me making it weird, but it always was uncomfortable for me. And to be able to just have that shipped to my home and deal with therapy over the phone or on my computer and through an app is such a nice advantage, particularly when I would have to get in the car, be in traffic, which would just make me more anxious about running late to get to therapy. I love this option and that it combines both the ability to have therapy and counseling and the ability to get medications if they are needed for you. This is one of the very few services that combines the two with licensed providers and then shipping your medication straight to your door. And they provide unlimited messaging because sometimes when you are working through stuff, you don't just need help Thursday morning at 9 a.m. when your appointment is scheduled. You might need to reach out to somebody in the in-between times. And that is a really valuable thing. I also love that Cerebral has partnered with Simone Biles as their chief impact officer. As you all know, I've talked about her on the channel. She's a huge advocate for mental health and reducing the stigma around getting treatment, which is why she loves using Cerebral. There shouldn't be a stigma around mental health treatment, and it should be affordable, accessible, and comfortable. And sometimes talking to someone in the comfort of your own home is exactly what you need. So if you are interested in trying out Cerebral, please do because Emily show listeners get 65% off their first month of medication management and care counseling at getcerebral.com slash Lawnard. That is getcerebral.com slash Lawnard for 65% off your first month. That's a total of just $30 to get started. Join Cerebral today on their mission to make quality mental health care accessible and affordable for all. Thank you so much, Cerebral, for sharing this discount and for partnering with today's show. Erica Girardi is being sued in both the bankruptcy court in Los Angeles and in Illinois by Edelson PC. Edelson PC filed for a declaratory judgment from the judge asking the judge, hey, your honor, can you make a ruling? Can you tell us if we can pursue this case in Illinois? So Edelson PC was asking, can we pursue Eric Girardi in Illinois? The concern of Edelson PC, and this is based on their filings being, if we pursue her in you know, Illinois, that there could be an issue with the bankruptcy trustee saying, no, uh, you're going after the same funds that we're going after, funds that might belong to the bankruptcy estate of Girardi Keys. Or Erica might say to the court, hey, I am protected under the bankruptcy because I am a part of this bankruptcy. Erica Girardi is not a named bankruptcy debtor. She is a co-debtor on some of the personal debts, but she was not a member of the law firm. She is not under that bankruptcy. But if the funds that were taken or not paid to the Lion Air clients went to Erica, there are these dual arguments of the bankruptcy trustee saying, yes, well, if it's money that needs to go into Girardi Keys, the law firm, it goes into Girardi Keys, the law firm's bankruptcy estate, and then it gets doled out or divvied up based on the order of priority and bankruptcy, which is all legally set and goes on in the bankruptcy court. It's the biggest part, really, other than collecting the money back, of dividing that money back out and seeing who it gets paid to and in what order. That is really the purpose of a bankruptcy and then discharging that bankruptcy at the end. So the debts are clear and the law firm at that point, I mean, it's already dissolving, but the law firm at that point is done and everyone just goes away. So the other argument from Edelson PC is yes, but if there is Lion Air funds in the Girardi Keys 
estate, that money was improperly gotten. That was embezzled funds because it was client funds. So it was never meant to be in the law firm's kind of pot or in the law firm's bank account. It never should have been divided out. And it never is meant to go back into the bankruptcy and be divided out to other clients. It's meant to be traced directly to those clients. And we would like the opportunity to trace it if it went from Boeing when they settled into Girardi Keys and then back out to Erica Girardi. If we can chase those funds, they are not part of the bankruptcy estate. They should be clawed back in the Illinois lawsuit from Erica Girardi and potentially the other lawyers at the firm and then paid back to the clients and then the legal fees paid. But Edelson PC has made clear in recent filings that they are not really seeking their legal fees. They are seeking to make sure these clients get paid back. There is much discussion of of whether the fee agreement between Girardi Keys and Edelson PC was a valid fee agreement. So when this came to court on November 16th in the bankruptcy court, there was a lot of back and forth in the filings. And in the middle of all of that, Ron Richards quit or was fired <laughs> from working as the special litigator for the bankruptcy trustee for Girardi Keys and brought the whole thing onto Twitter the way that Ron Richards does things on Twitter. So it was very interesting to watch this all unfold because the documents being filed were objections from the bankruptcy trustee and then also objections from Erica Girardi. And Erica Girardi's objections were very strongly worded against Edelson PC, calling the fee agreement unethical and illegal and improper and really going in and going after Edelson PC and kind of being joined in that by Ron Richards on social media sharing her motion. When Edelson PC filed a responsive motion, and I broke that down over on uh, YouTube, when they filed a responsive motion, they kind of called out this apparent cooperation between Erica Girardi and Ron Richards, which was so odd because we'd seen him uh, really skewering her on social media for months leading up to this, to the point where Erica Girardi's attorney, Evan C. Borges, filed two motions to remove Ron Richards based on his social media activity against Erica Girardi and took that up on appeal when it was denied by the court. The court wants no part of online fuckery. And that was very clear. The court wants no part of the lawyers making soliloquies for whomever may be listening. The court was like, what do I need to decide today? And can you all please move on? And it was very interesting to watch that happen. So the filings back and forth were fiery leading up to this. But as Ron Richards was removed from the bankruptcy, and the reason I say removed is because it makes no sense to me that he would quit because he was on a contingency fee agreement, which means that he was getting paid only when he recovered money from Erica Girardi. He has said on social media that he's put quite a lot of time and energy into this. He's given interviews. Most of them you guys send me clips of. I don't go seeking them out. The last thing I need in my life is listening to more lawyers talk. I talk enough for literally all of me. <laughs> but but when stuff comes up that's related to this, I appreciate all of you that are like, here, did you hear this? Did you hear that? So has definitely made clear that he wasn't getting paid until money came in from Erica. And we saw that in the filings when he was appointed. It was always very interesting to me that he was appointed a special trustee or special litigator for the trustee because he had been so vocal about this case on social media. It was a very odd circumstance. And I've done a couple episodes breaking down those motions and the applications and the fee agreement that was filed by the court because all of this happens, you know, or should happen out in the open in the bankruptcy court. So he doesn't get paid unless he brings money in from Erica. He said online that he has uh, spent lots of time, energy, and resources. It's always a royal we. We've spent lots of time and energy and resources. Our mission is this and this and that. It's never quite clear who we is or our is, but okay. And he shared on social media that he was not meeting our mission. Our mission, whoever our is in Richards's, in Richards's sphere of calling out attorneys and they weren't able to comment as freely as they wanted to. And this is why they were parting ways with being an official or a hired attorney on this bankruptcy case, which seemed odd because Richards didn't seem very constrained on social media and had said when he did a victory lap after the judge 
skewered Erica's motion saying, you know, essentially this has, this is baseless. It's delay. It has no point. This attorney has a first amendment, right? They can say whatever they want on the interwebs. Um, he really did a victory lap. Like we're not constrained in our speech. We're not constrained in what we say. Now, of course there are things that shouldn't be said in pre-trial publicity. And Erica does have a right to trial on this suit in the bankruptcy court. And I had been vocally critical about some of those things like the American express bill. If you guys watch my other content, I've talked about that, but it didn't seem that there was a significant constraint in the, the updates and the tweeting about the case and even being critical of Erica at the real housewives reunions and things like this. Um, it seemed that that was still going on. So it was odd that that was the reason cited for stepping away. And then Jay Edelson from Edelson PC was on Twitter saying that Ron Richards was fired from the case and that now that he was removed, the bankruptcy trustee for Girardi Keese would be removing their objection to Edelson going after Erica Girardi in the Illinois case. And that, in fact, did happen. Also, if my other train of thought was, oh, maybe they've determined Erica has no money and that nothing is coming back into this bankruptcy, which has long been the position of Erica's lawyer, Evan Borges, in the very limited interaction he's had with the media and the limited interviews that he's given. And that's not me being critical. I think he's probably doing other work and doesn't really give a shit about giving statements to the media with literally just like, this is a bankruptcy case. I'm just, I'm doing my job. We're not going to speak to the media much. He has said in interviews that there really isn't just some pot of money there. Erica has said it too. There's no pot of gold. There's no hidden money. There's no, we, I'd like to know where it is. And you've seen her say that over and over this last season of Real Housewives. If there's this, if there's all this money somewhere, I'd sure like to know where it is. And so part of me was like, well, maybe it was determined that there just wasn't. They've gone through the books and it just wasn't. But what we're seeing from more recent filings is that the bankruptcy trustee is still very involved in a forensic accounting. And that is months and months away of being finished. And then the bankruptcy trustee appointed or asked the court to appoint another special litigator. So the Girardi Keese bankruptcy trustee has brought in another lawyer. So they're still going after Erica. They're just doing it without Ron Richards, which when you have Ron Richards saying, I need to be able to be more vocal on social, but is looking at 40% of what they asserted was $20 million, it leaves you scratching your head. If there's no money there, they wouldn't bring in another lawyer to go chase down nothing on a contingency agreement because that lawyer wouldn't get paid. And who's got time for all of that? And then you've got Jay Edelson saying, you know, Ron Richards has been fired. He's been removed from this case. And we know that new counsel's coming in and we know this is being removed. And then the next day, those things come to fruition, lending credibility to what was said on Twitter. So it's a very interesting situation because Ron Richards is still on social media referring in the royal we to the things going on in the bankruptcy, though we know he's no longer counsel and has been removed from the case. So there's strangeness there. But on that November 16th court hearing, the bankruptcy trustee for Girardi Keese was there. The lawyers for both trustees were there. Lawyers from Edelson PC were there. Erica's attorney, Evan C. Borges, was present physically in court. Everything else was on Zoom. And the attorneys went back and forth about this motion. The court didn't want to hear literally any of it. The court was like, most of this isn't for me to decide if the bankruptcy trustees aren't arguing, why, why can't I just make this declaratory judgment? And that's what the court did. The court said, yes, you can pursue Erica, but it's pursuant to the stipulation or the agreement with the bankruptcy court that any monies that are found, there needs to be a conversation with the bankruptcy. Edelson PC can't just like take the money and run. Oh, take the money and run. Ooh, now. Come on, take the money and run. All right, we're not, we're, that's going to be in my head. Yeah, the rest of the day. Anyway, <laughs> Edelson PC can't just take, the, there has to be coordination and collaboration with the bankruptcy trustee to make sure that the monies that are going back to the Lion Air clients are monies that are not supposed to be in the bankruptcy estate and divided up in the order of, of, you know, priority through the bankruptcy. And that's really the main point of all of this. So Erica now has to defend the lawsuit or respond to the lawsuit in Illinois and then deal with being sued by the bankruptcy trustee still in the, you know, in the California bankruptcy court. It'll be interesting if they have jurisdiction personally over Erica in Illinois, because Erica's not one of the lawyers. She's not 
the lawyers that appeared in this Lion Air case. She's not, you know, inextricably connected to the law firm. She might have gotten funds. That's the argument here that belonged to the clients that the court has an interest in clawing back. But whether that gives the court jurisdiction over her or not is a whole nother question. And all of you are like, oh, it comes back to jurisdiction. Yes. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It often comes back to jurisdiction. And that's really where we're at with, you know, Ron Richards has either been yeeted or yeeted thyself, but why would you eat thyself out of 40% of $20 million when you've already started working on it? And uh, by all of his own accounts, spent a substantial amount of time. And you've got, you know, the objections being withdrawn and Erica now having to defend. You also had Erica's attorney in court kind of fighting back about these fee agreements. And this is going to come up. How did Edelson PC and Girardi Keys agree to pay Edelson PC as local counsel? Whether that was proper or not proper is going to be decided by the court in Illinois, not what's going on in California. Edelson PC's local counsel in the Illinois firm, whether Girardi Keys did something wrong or improper is almost moot at this point because the firm can't be punished. The attorney that did it can't be punished, but it will come up in early December as the other two attorneys for the firm, David Lira and Keith Griffin, go before the court in Illinois on a contempt hearing and an evidentiary contempt hearing because the court in Illinois wants to know one simple thing that we all want to know too is where the fuck's the money and why the fuck didn't you tell me? And you other lawyers on this case had an obligation and a duty to the clients what happened. And I think we'll see a lot of finger pointing towards Tom Girardi, who's not going to show up in court, has already filed a statement that he will be pleading the fifth and he's under a conservatorship. So he can't give competent testimony anyway, which some are saying can, is convenient. And some are saying, well, maybe that's the, the state of affairs. And if the lawyers knew that, shouldn't they have let the court know earlier, or at least taken the reins of the law firm and protected the clients or done some anything, something, anything. So early December, uh, almost a year after this suit was, or a little more, no, a little less than a year after this suit was filed would be very interesting. If Erica files a motion to dismiss based on lack of jurisdiction, we're going to go through it because we love a chat about jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction and where it extends and where it doesn't. So that's really where we're at. There are other things happening in the bankruptcy courts. They're still trying to sell um, the estate in Pasadena and the bankruptcy trustee in the law firm side is still doing a forensic accounting and is trying to resolve and seeing what's being resolved with the other cases to bring money in to the bankruptcy to keep dividing it out to the clients who deserve to get paid. And of course, to the legal lenders who in this order of priority are at the top. So we're going to be keeping an eye not only on the Twitter shade between lawyers, but on this case as a whole. It is time to switch topics briefly. Well, it's going to be more than brief. I always say brief and then it's never brief. I should just never say that word ever, but we're going to switch over and talk about the Rust case. But before we do, I would like to thank our sponsor. A huge thank you to today's sponsor, Beta Brand. You know that I've been working with Beta Brand for a while now, and it's because not only did I love these dress pants before I left a formal work setting at the district attorney's office and would wear them to court all the time because they are dress pants, but they're yoga pants, but they're dress pants. And now they also have denim that are yoga pants, but they're dress pants. They're so comfortable and so easy to pair either with sneakers and dress down or to go to court and dressed up, which is what I love. And with the holidays coming, it's nice to have pants that not only fit well, but make you feel good and are comfortable for everything that this holiday season throws at us. I've been thrilled seeing your feedback about your beta brand pants on social media. I love seeing what you have picked. I love knowing that these have made a difference for you. And I love that there are so many law nerds out there walking around feeling snatched in pants that not just look good, but also feel good. They are machine washable. They have yoga denim. They're polished, but they're comfortable. And today, for you, my lovely Emily Show audience, they are also 30% off. Right now, our listeners 
and YouTube viewers get 30% off their beta brand orders. When you go to betabrand.com slash Emily, that's right. Beta brand B E T A B R A N D dot com slash Emily for 30% off your order for a limited time. Do not wait. Go now go. And when you use this special URL, you're also supporting the show. Find out why women are ditching typical work pants for beta brand dressed yoga pants. You will not regret it. I haven't. My only regret is that I don't order enough pairs at a time and then I have to wait when I reorder. <laughs> Go to betabrand.com slash Emily for 30% off and thank you for sponsoring another Emily show. In the Rust tragedy, the script supervisor who was also back by the camera during the shooting that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins and injured the director on scene is also suing, but is suing in a different way than the lawsuit we talked about yesterday. Yesterday, last episode, <laughs> it feels like yesterday to me, but that we talked about in our last episode. In the lawsuit from Sergei Sventnoy, they are suing for general negligence, just one cause of action, and are suing Rust Movie Productions, LLC, Hannah Gutierrez, Reed the Armorer, Sarah Zachary, Seth, Seth Kenny, who um, is related to that gun being on set or, or, or produced the replica firearm for being on set, is somehow tied to that firearm, Dave Hall's The AD, El Dorado Pictures, Inc., Calvary Media, Inc., Thomasville Pictures, LLC, Brittany House Pictures, Short Porch Pictures, LLC, Third Shift Media, LLC, Alexander R. Baldwin the Third, Ron Donald Smith, um, Nathan Kling Klinger, I think, Ryan Winstreen, um, and a number of others in their individual or professional capacities, plus um, does one through 100, but just one uh, one count of general negligence. The difference here is in the script supervisor's lawsuit, not only did the script supervisor provide a very thorough statement of what happened that we are going to go through, I will warn you before we get to it because it is a lot of detail, but um, the script supervisor, Mimi Mitchell, filed for assault, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and deliberate infliction of harm and those are much different charges or causes of action. It, it, it happens. You will hear the prosecutor slip out in slip out in my vernacular, especially in how much I've been talking about criminal cases as of late. So, yes, you'll hear the me say charges. I always mean causes of action, <laughs> unless I'm talking about crimes, and then I mean charges. You know what I mean. But Mamie Mitchell is suing for assault. IIED and deliberate infliction of harm and is suing a slew of individuals, including Rust Movie Productions, LLC, Alexander R. Baldwin, the, the third. So Alec Baldwin is named second in this suit. El Dorado Pictures, Inc., Ryan Donald Smith, Lange Allen Cheney, Thomasville Pictures, Inc., Nathan Klinger, uh, Ryan Winstron, and Short Pictures, LLC, and a number of others including the armorer Hannah Gutierrez, including Seth Kinney, but not including the AD Dave Halls. Oh, nope, there he is. I wasn't seeing him, and then I was like, wait, he's got to be in there somewhere, and he is. So I'm going to go through the statement from Mamie Mitchell first, and then we will go through the complaint just a bit. And the reason I'm going through this statement first is because it's just going to give us more information. And this was filed in court. The attorney for script supervisor, Mamie Mitchell, who I'm just going to refer to it as Mitchell, uh, is Gloria Allred. So this is, we don't always see a statement like this filed, but we do in this case because it, A, it gives everyone a really visceral response. So as we get into this, it is a very detailed breakdown of what happened when Helena Hutchins died. And I will say from a kind of lawyer tactical perspective, the fact that a wrongful death lawsuit for Helena Hutchins has not been filed yet might be a good thing for their lawyers because they're seeing quite a lot of information coming in through these other lawsuits and they're getting more of a full picture of what happened that day because that will be filed for 
um, and on behalf of her husband and her son. And they weren't there. They weren't on set. They don't know. So getting this full picture from the other individuals that were behind the camera is really going to benefit their lawyers in that wrongful death lawsuit. The statement starts with good morning, and I'm just going to read through it. It says, before Helena was shot and killed and our director, Joel, was shot and injured on the set of Rust, my life was fairly simple and I was generally a very healthy and happy woman with one large responsibility. I am the guardian to my sister, four years older than me, who is severely intellectually disabled and in a group home in Texas. I have been her primary decision maker since 1996. On Thursday, October 21st, 2021, I got up early and drove to Bonanza Creek Ranch for a 6.30 a.m. call. When I got there, I was told that the camera crew and both of the second ACs and camera utility had quit because of safety issues and other issues related to their working conditions. That morning, we shot scene 115 at the church with Alec, and then we blocked and rehearsed scene 118. We did three camera setups for scene 118 and broke for lunch. The camera setups to complete the scene in the afternoon were discussed between Joel, Helena, and me. I was sitting at a table doing my lunch report and Helena walked by and flashed her gorgeous smile at me. I will never forget that. She was a great collaborator on the set and my new friend. She was pure light. She had a beautiful energy. After lunch, I went inside the church with members of the crew to get ready for the camera setup that we had discussed before lunch. I saw Alec going through his movement with the gun for the camera. I was holding my script in my left hand and had taken out my iPhone and opened up my photos to check the continuity on his shirt and vest. Then an explosion, deafening loud gunshot. I was stunned. I heard someone moaning and I turned around and my director was falling backwards and holding his upper body. And I turned toward Alec and saw Helena going down to the left of me. I ran outside and called 911 for help. We waited and eventually they brought Helena out to the ambulance waiting outside the door. She was on a stretcher and not moving. They had some kind of large oxygen balloon thing on her face and her left hand was on her stomach. I believe um, that's an Ambu bag. When they do CPR, they use uh, the bag to compress and, and push air through the, the face mask that goes over the nose and mouth. It continues to say her left hand was on her stomach. It was blue. I could not believe this was happening. I gave my statement to law enforcement and drove home. Ten minutes after I got home, someone notified me that she was dead. I stood in my driveway screaming. I will never forget what happened on the set of Russ that day. I relived the shooting and the sound of the explosion from the gun over and over again. I am depressed. I don't feel safe. I feel that at any moment, anything could happen to me and to those I care about and are standing close to me. I do not have a sense of guardrails in my life to keep me safe. I am frightened of the future. This violent tragedy has taken away the joy in my life. I've also lost a new friend who is an extraordinary and rare person and a future collaborator. Helena was a woman who spoke the same language of film as I did. I have been robbed of my new friend. I am very sad and heartbroken for her son and husband her sister and family, and all of her friends who are suffering this preventable and unimaginable loss. I never want what happened on our set to ever happen to anyone else. I mean, I, I agreed, such an avoidable tragedy. And it just, you can feel, um, you can feel the frustration in this statement, right? It goes on to say, I have spent 40 years as a script supervisor and in other capacities in this industry. Before this happened, it has always been a safe space, familiar, stimulating, and an inspiring place for me to work. It is where I have had my career and made my living. I have worked all over this country and in films where there were guns on set. I have never before seen anything like what happened on October 21st, and I never want to see what happened on that date happen again. And then it says statement, uh, Mamie Mitchell, represented by Gloria Alred, November 17th. It is not a signed statement, it is a typed out statement. And in the lawsuit, there is that request for intentional infliction of emotional distress. It's interesting to me they didn't also add the lower negligent infliction of emotional distress. And we'll get into this suit to see what the intentionality is. I've covered a lot of cases in our content 
particularly this last year, and a lot of the defamation suits that deal with both intentional infliction of emotional distress and negligent infliction of emotional distress, the IIED and NIED. And you generally have to prove that you are, in fact, distressed. So it doesn't surprise me in uh, her statement that Mitchell said, I am depressed. I've had a sense of joy robbed. Like these losses, these uh, somewhat tangible losses that you can prove through uh, diagnoses, through meetings with doctors and things like that, you're seeing um, come to bear in this filing. And, you know, when we talk about things like the Vanessa Bryant filing against the County of LA, you also see the County of LA now asking for proof of records, proof that there's this emotional distress, because you do have to prove that there is emotional distress. And I think that in in both cases, uh, most can empathize that this would be a traumatic and distressing event and that anyone can suffer trauma from an event like this. And there is no shame in dealing with trauma. Trauma is trauma. And it is how we respond to it is not our choice. Our bodies respond. And that's something that I think people don't always talk about, don't understand, particularly when you're dealing with things like post-traumatic stress. Events like this are are just so clearly going to lead to post-traumatic stress for the people that were there. Going to work and having your coworker killed is a traumatic event that is going to affect everyone that was on that set and the people that knew people that were on that set. So there's no, um, there shouldn't be stigma around being like this really fucked up thing happened and it's been really awful for me. And that's where this intentional infliction of emotional distress claim comes in. So let's start going through this complaint that is going to have more details in it. The lawsuit starts with On October 21st, 2021, on the set of the production Rust, defendant Alec Baldwin, and yes, it has his full legal name, but I'm I'm summarizing as we go, fired a loaded gun containing a live bullet, killing director of photographer Helena Hutchins, injuring director Joel Souza, and causing physical and emotional injuries to plaintiff Mamie Mitchell, the script supervisor who was standing in the line of fire when the gun went off. Days before shooting, a camera operator had reported two unexpected gun discharges during a rehearsal in a cabin. This is super unsafe, the camera operator wrote in a text message to the production manager. On the day of the shooting, union camera operators and their assistants had walked off the job to protest working conditions, including concerns about safety. Every safety protocol designed to ensure that firearms would be safely used were ignored and actions that were taken against all industry norms, including without limitations, as follows. Live ammunition was allowed onto the set, despite the fact that live ammunition is never to be used, nor brought onto any studio lot or stage. Right, because shit like this can happen. Accidents with guns on sets happen without there being live ammunition. There's no excuse for live ammunition being on set. I just, I can't fathom how it got there, who bought it, who brought it and why it was there because there's no purpose for it. It serves no role. There's no reason that should be there. It goes on to say Alec Baldwin intentionally without just cause or excuse cocked and fired the loaded gun, even though the upcoming scene to be filmed did not call for the cocking and firing of the firearm, which is hugely significant because we had heard in early news reports that this was a maybe an accidental fire or a misfire or the gun just went off. Cocking and firing a revolver is more than just a, we bumped the gun and the gun mysteriously went off. And that is not just rehearsing. That is, that is actually taking actions to cock and fire a weapon, which if you're rehearsing for a scene where that's not required, then why are you doing it? They go on to allege that Alec Baldwin intentionally and without just cause fired the gun towards individuals, including plaintiff, Miss Hutchins, Mr. Souza, even though protocol was not to do so. The gun was handed to Alec Baldwin by the assistant director, uh, that's Halls. Guns are never to be handed to an actor by anyone other than the prop master or armorer. Mr. Baldwin, being an industry veteran, knew that the gun in question should not have been handed to him by the AD, and he also knew that he could not rely upon the AD's representations that it was a, quote, cold gun, end quote, and that the gun was safe to use. The industry-wide safety bulletin for use of firearms mandates that all firearms are to be treated as though they are loaded. Right! 
because that's gun safety basics. <sighs> because as Alec Baldwin knew, guns are inherently dangerous weapons. Alec Baldwin should have assumed that the gun in question was loaded unless and until it was demonstrated to him or checked by him that it was not loaded. They're going after Baldwin in this pretty more aggressively than I thought in my uh, first glance at this. We're going to continue on. I, I'm not saying they're wrong to do so. I'm just noted. They go on to say he had no right to rely on some alleged statement by the assistant director that it was a, quote, cold gun, end quote. I don't know if it's alleged that that statement was made. I think everyone on set said he yelled cold gun, whether it was accurate or not, is alleged and is clearly false because it was not a cold gun because of the result, like the thing speaks for itself. They go on to say Mr. Baldwin cannot hide behind the assistant director to attempt to excuse the fact that he did not check the gun himself. Alec Baldwin, without just cause or excuse, failed to check the gun to see if the firearm was loaded. The industry norm is that the armorer hands the gun to the actor and demonstrates to the actor, in this case Baldwin, that the gun chambers are empty. Aside, not hard to do in a revolver. You just roll it out and then open it and show them. Roll it back. It takes seconds. The industry norm and safety bulletin mandates that no one shall be issued a firearm until he or she is trained in safe handling, safe use, the safe lock, and proper firing procedures. Alec Baldwin knew that these were safety protocols and chose to ignore them. If the industry norm is that Alec Baldwin, in this case, would have had firearm training, I would love them to bring that into the civil suits because everything that was done goes against proper firearm handling and protocol and just is, is unexcusable. And had proper firearm protocol been followed, Alec could have checked the gun himself and wouldn't have been pointing it at somebody and cocking and firing it in the first place because you don't, that you, you, what are you thinking? Cause you don't do that. They go on to say all guns and ammunition are supposed to be secured throughout production. The armor is required to keep all guns and ammunitions locked up or to stay with the guns and ammunition until they are used. Instead, the armor allowed guns and ammo to be left unattended on a rolling cart outside the church at midday on Thursday during the lunch break. And that's been mentioned in two lawsuits now. They go on to say that safety bulletins put out by the industry-wide labor management safety committee are normally sent to everyone that gets the call sheet for the day. This was not done, and all safety protocols required were not followed, which is them alleging that corners are being cut that led to this. The events that led to the shooting by Mr. Baldwin of a loaded gun constituted intentional acts and or omissions. That goes to the legal standards that they're going to need to prove. Without any just cause or excuse on Alec Baldwin's part or the producers of Rust, Mr. Baldwin chose to play Russian roulette with a loaded gun without checking it and without having the armorer do so. His behavior and that of the producers on Rust were intentional acts or omissions without any just cause or excuse and with utter disregard of the consequences of said acts and or omissions. The fact that live ammunition was allowed on a movie set, that guns and ammunition were left unattended, that the gun in question was handed to Mr. Baldwin by the assistant director who had no business doing so, the fact that safety bulletins were not promulgated or ignored, coupled with the fact that the scene in question did not call for the gun to be fired at all, makes this case where injury or death was much more than just a possibility. It was a likely result. They go and define all the parties and really in their opening gave us a very thorough recitation of their perception of the facts. And again, lawsuits are allegations in shade. This is the plaintiff's perception of what happened. This is their telling of what happened. We're now seeing similar allegations across multiple lawsuits. This one was stronger language than the other. I'm not going to go through the breakdown of the incident because we got it in Mitchell's statement, but I can understand why they have brought the charges for intentional infliction of emotional distress and the others. They talk about the film being low budget. They talk about the film endangering the lives of cast and crew because of it and go on and name the other defendants in that. And then they get into their causes of action. With regard to the intentional infliction of emotional distress, they allege that Baldwin's conduct was extreme and outrageous under the facts and circumstances of filmmaking because he pointed and discharged the loaded gun towards plaintiff. They go on and talk about the acts or omissions and the fact that this has left the plaintiff with 
emotional and or physical injuries. Plaintiff was severely injured without limitation. Her health strength activity has sustained serious physical trauma and shock and injury to her nervous system and person, all of which injuries have caused and continue to cause plaintiff extreme mental, physical, and nervous pain. And that needs to be alleged when you have an IIED. Then the deliberate infliction of harm reiterates some of the same facts that we heard before about the fact that Baldwin wasn't even required to cock and fire the gun in that scene, that the armorer did not use due care and cause, that the 24-year-old armorer um, was not perhaps experienced in handling firearms and set safety. And then the prayer for relief asks for punitive damages, costs, you know, interest, future losses and earnings and earning capacity, compensatory general and special damages uh, jointly and severally at an amount to be proven at trial. So there's not an amount attached to this lawsuit. It is kind of all of what's appropriate and acceptable. And I'm, I'm, I think we will see others, especially from those that were in the church when this shooting happened for the distress that they have suffered. I won't be surprised to see more of those and we will continue to cover them. Putting an entire workplace, an entire set at risk is unacceptable and it costs the life of someone who shouldn't have died at work. It's it's really horrific and just avoidable. I mean, acc accidents happen, but this was not an accident because if there hadn't been you know, live bullets on the set, would this have happened? Probably not. If Baldwin hadn't cocked and pulled the trigger, would this have happened? Probably not. So you've now got these intentional acts that they're alleging that led up to this shooting. Um, it is just, it is a lot. And more and more information comes out and the more information that comes out, uh, the more, I don't know, outrageous the conduct is. So we will keep an eye on these lawsuits. They will be going likely for years, um, unless they settle. But I think we will see years of litigation over this. Lonard, take care of yourself. We are getting into the holiday season. The holidays can be, can be a lot. I know that they can be a lot. It causes me stress too. And these lawsuits are causing me stress. We're going to have to go back to Tiger King next week or something and talk about all of those lawsuits because we need, we need to have a giggle. Where's Colin and Cuthbert, the caterpillars when you need them? Take care of yourselves, be kind to yourself, and have a wonderful rest of your week. Raise a glass and say it with me. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May your family be well. May the odds be ever in your favor. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a law nerd, and I will see you in the next one. Bye, friend. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D. Baker. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com. Happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube.